Hallelujah. Well, here's the message today. Be like Jesus. Amen. Be like Jesus. And um, I could have went a lot of different ways with this. I could have just focused on the first verse. We're working our way through Ephesians today. We've finally made our way to chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. Two more chapters left. I was looking at it the other day as far as the sections, unless the Lord directs me otherwise. We got about approximately about nine weeks left in the book of Ephesians, and then we're going to move on to something else. But um, that's approximately how many sections I didn't... You know, it's funny. I actually... There's some pastors that are so organized... And um, that's normally not me. This is the first time, to be honest, that I've done what's called an expository series straight through an entire book. Um, but I've talked to pastors. they got like a preaching calendar figured out for like a year and a half, two years. Or This is what I'm going to be preaching on for the next two years. And to me, I'm like, how could you do that? And their answer, thankfully, was good. It was like, well, I keep... I keep margin in there for if the Lord interrupts me and says, go a different direction. Don't get me wrong. But this is my plan if the Lord shouldn't, you know, give me a specific direction for this week. Or that. Is that I'm working my way through this, then I'm going to work my way through that. And I'm like, well, man, you're better than me. I'm, my calendar is like, what am I doing in September? <laughs> you know, I'm not hard. Well, that's not totally true. We do got a missions banquet in October and a few things coming up. But for the most part, preaching wise. Be like Jesus. Let's read our passage for the day, Ephesians 5, 1 through 7. And it says this, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children. I could just preach a whole message on just one verse right there. I really could. And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Here's the bad stuff. But fornication... And all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. Kind of funny how we were talking about this a little bit in Sunday school this morning. As is fitting for the saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting. That's a word we don't use that much anymore. That means joking. Coarse joking, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. Our whole Christian experience could be summed up in three words. Be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. You know, all through the beginning chapters of this book that we've been studying together in Ephesians, you've seen what Jesus has accomplished for us. The reality of this covenant, this new covenant relationship with God. What he's accomplished on the cross. The fact that we're now part of his kingdom. And we've seen all that. Now what we're starting to get into in these later chapters is this idea of how can we walk that out? If it's true in the spirit, man, how can I now walk that out in my life? And so when examining ourselves to see how our walk is, we are instructed in this passage right here is to compare yourself with Jesus. Compare yourself to the way it says, basically it says, be imitators of God. And then the contrast, comparison and contrast, that's the two words that always go together. And then we contrast it by not walking according to these descriptive words they give here. I'll just say the uncleanness, if you will, of the world. So I'm going to be kind of breaking this down into three main points today. Number one is be like Jesus. First, what does it mean to be an imitator of God? How can we be like Jesus? First... Let it be firmly established in your mind that the Bible does want us to imitate the way that Jesus Christ lived. And therefore, if God calls us to do that, it's possible. Okay? That's the first hurdle we got to get over with this kind of message. Some people believe that it's unattainable to really be, every time that something is said about living a certain way, well, that's Jesus. I mean, he's God. He can do that. 
But if we believe it's unattainable, then we may not try. With the, we may not give the effort required to live a life that's holy. But I'm here to tell you that, first of all, we got to go with the Word and not what we think. The Word says, be imitators of God. Imitate God. If we go back to a couple weeks ago, in Ephesians 4.24, it says this, to put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. I never thought of the word that way, but did you hear that? It says, put on the new man, which was created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. Well, I can't live like Jesus. Who says I can live a life like Jesus? Well, according to God, you're righteous and you're holy. I didn't say it. I look at you and I think, you're a knucklehead. Not really true. Most of you guys, that's not true. Just a couple. I'm not going to say who. <laughs> but according to God, you're righteous and holy. If you've accepted Jesus, you know the big old work that you did to get that? You believed upon Jesus Christ. That's right. That's all you were able to do is believe upon what he did and give a weak, little weak, yes, God, I'll do it. That's all you had to offer. Nothing else. God did all the work. He carried the cross. He took your sin. He took your shame. He took your sickness. He took your pain. God took it all upon himself, and all we were able to do was say yes. And if you said that, according to God... You're righteous and holy. So as I've said before, it's just a little phrase, it's time to resemble that remark. If God said that about us, how do we walk that out? Well, we got to imitate God. Here's another scripture that says that. 1 John 2 and 5 says this. But who, and I, I underlined a few things because there's keys in here. When you see these up here, if you ever see it underlined, check this out, there's a key there about how you're going to be able to do this. But whoever keeps his word, the truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. By what? By keeping his word. And here's what happens when you do that. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. How? How should we walk? Just as he he walked. Well, pretty close? No, no, just as. Well, you know, as best as I can do? No, no, just as he walked. We ought to walk the same way that Jesus walked. Man, that's, I'm telling you, how can you say that you're going to walk like Jesus? I'm not the one that said it. It's according to God. According to God, I'm righteous and holy. Guess who else was righteous and holy? Jesus. If he was righteous and holy, and I'm righteous and holy, i got to learn how to walk the way that Jesus did. So, how did Jesus walk? Well, in our passage here, verse 2 actually says, walk in love. So we got to learn how to walk in love. Well, that was easy for Jesus, because the Bible says God is love. All he had to do was be himself. Well, actually, that's all we have to do. We have to learn how to be who we really are. What we're learning on this whole walking thing is getting what's true on the inside. According to God, on the inside, you're righteous and holy. Well, is it possible that what's true on the inside can be what's on the outside? Yes, that's what the Bible is trying to teach us this whole time. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. The new man is the inside man, the one that's righteous and holy, just like Jesus, perfect and perfected, as we've been just reading, he, said, he says right here, the love of God is perfected in him. It's still up there, thank God. Perfected. I'm telling you, all we're trying to do is get what's true to come on the outside and be true on the outside the same as it is on the inside. That's all we're trying to do. I'm not trying to get you to do something like get a, uh, something that uh, should be uh, like strange to you. This ought to be the truth. So that greatest moment, the moment where you're connected with God in worship, that moment where all you got is love for God. Well, now just live that way all the time. 
Instead of just at that moment when the music is so nice and you're just like, hallelujah, and tears are coming down your face. Whoops, excuse me. And all that stuff is going on. Now just be that way all the time. All the time. Okay? All right. Let's close with prayer. Just joking. <laughs> Jesus' love, or that love was expressed by adhering to the Word of God. Here's how Jesus did it. Jesus is the living Word. Jesus is love. And so he walked according to, his, to God's word. Interesting, I, I heard it said this way one time, being that everything that Jesus said was written, or not everything, but everything that was written became infallible scripture, right? So when Jesus was being tempted by the devil, this is just a freebie, and the devil said, it is written such and such, you know, Jesus could have said anything he wanted. He could have just said, abracadabra, kalakazoo, and that would have immediately been inerrant word. But he didn't. What did Jesus use? Jesus used the words that were already written. He said, it's also written. So if Jesus had to use the word in order to uh, navigate this world, if you will, then what makes us think that we can just say whatever we want and it's going to work out good for us? We got to be people of the word. Jesus walked in the word. And then he also walked in the love. He walked in the love by oftentimes saying that he was actually pouring out what he saw the Father doing, having compassion upon people. And we can do the same thing. That's why the Bible says, I don't have the scripture here, but I just, I just had jotted this down. It says, he who loves me obeys my commandments. And he said, and they're not burdensome. I don't remember where that scripture even is right offhand, but somebody, look it up. It's there. I guarantee it's a scripture. It said, and they're not burdensome. It is not burdensome to live God's way. You want to know what's burdensome? Living under the yoke of uh, addiction, living under the yoke of hatred, unforgiveness, that's burdensome. That wearies you, that wears you down. Trying to be something that you're not, that's what wears you down. You want to know what's not burdensome? Living the way that you actually are, letting the real man get onto the outside. That's not burdensome. God's word is not a list of rules. It's a person. His name is Jesus Christ. That's God's word. And God's word is not burdensome. It's true freedom. It's true freedom to walk with God the way that Jesus walked. Jesus, as our example, walked in love. Well, there's three things I want you to get here. He walked, he walked in love in his thinking. He walked in love in his speaking. And therefore, he walked in love in his living. We imitate Jesus in our thinking. We imitate Jesus in our speaking. And we imitate Jesus in our living. And that's the order. Thinking, speaking, living. It's a little bit of a review. I just said this last week, but it's really good. Like I had mentioned on a Sunday night not long ago, we need to all be in unity as far as the word of God understanding what the Word of God says and having good teaching in this church. It's very important. God has showed me that's part of a vision for the future is that we got to be together on the Word, mature in God's Word. But here's a little bit of review. What you think is what you're going to believe. What you believe is what you're going to say. And what you say is what you get in your life. If you want blessing, you got to speak blessing. You will never speak blessing if you're not thinking blessing. You'll never think blessing if you're not reading about the blessing. It comes in that order. It's got to be in that order. Some people think, well, I'll start living right, and then I'll... No, 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 no. Wrong. If you don't think right, you'll never say right, and your words are the, are the issues of life and death are in our words. So you think right, you speak right, you say right. This is why Jesus was able to do it, because he understood who he was. He thought right, and so therefore he spoke right, and so therefore he lived right. He knew who he was, he believed it, he spoke it, and he lived it. Do you know who you are? Do you know who you really are on the inside? Not who somebody told you, not what career you're hoping to have. Do you know who you are? Well, if you do, then believe it, speak it, and live it. So how did Jesus live? 
Acts 10 and 38 says this, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So, how did Jesus live? One, he lived with the anointing. Number two, he lived with the help and direction of the Holy Spirit. This is the next slide, if, if you got it there. He lived with the anointing. He lived with the help and direction of the Holy Spirit and with power, of course, because the Holy Spirit comes with power. Number three, Jesus went about doing good. Number four, Jesus healed the sick. Number five, he delivered those who were under the oppression of the devil. And 1 John 2, 6 says that he who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So how are we supposed to live? With the anointing, with the help and direction of the Holy Spirit, and with power, going about doing good, healing the sick, and delivering those under the oppression of the devil. That covers a lot of territory right there. I'm convinced that the reason a lot of Christians look like the world and not like Jesus is because scriptures like this just seem too challenging or unattainable. Therefore, we just give up. But I'm here to tell you, if God said to do it, that means it has to be attainable. If God gives the direction, God brings the provision. That's the way that God works. When God says to do something, he does not tell you to do it and then doesn't give you the supply with which to do it. He who supplies seed to the sower, ain't that what the word of God says? He who supplies seed to the sower. So when he tells you go out and sow, well, the seed gets supplied by, the, by God, right? And so when the Lord said go out, be fruitful and multiply, there was a way to do it. You know, God, if he tells us to do something, then there's a way to do it. Now, we'll miss the mark occasionally on this walking with Jesus because we're imitating, be imitators of God. We're imitating the master. We're not the master ourselves. I always got to throw that in. Some people will get out of sorts and be like, is he telling me that I'm supposed to be God? No, I'm not, okay? But... We're not the master ourselves, but we're being transformed day by day into his image. And on the inside, you are in the image of God, if you're a born-again believer here today. So we're supposed to imitate God, be like Jesus, walk in love, and we're not supposed to copy these behaviors of the world. And this is what I call, in this point number two, the dying saint. The dying saint. So remember, he's writing to the church in Ephesus. He's not writing to a, a social club that he's hoping might get saved someday. He's writing to a church, okay? So here's what he says to the church. Are you guys the church? Yes. All right. Who, who's the church? We're the church. And here's what he says to the church. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coast, coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. It sounds simple enough. Christians shouldn't be involved in fornication and stuff of that nature. Uh, which, by the way, just covers everything that is in our world today. Not only just having sexual intercourse out of marriage, but it's also talking, that covers homosexuality. That covers... Um, Anything that would be in a, in a lewdness in some of the things that you see um, out there in the public, that sort of thing regarding that. But uncleanness, now that covers everything. Anything that's not clean like God is unclean. But those two, so we, we look right away and you see the fornication or the uncleanness and it's like, well, but it's linked to this idea of covetousness. Covetousness is an appetite of carnal man to never be able to get enough, always needing something more. You, you want to know why that's mentioned here with Christians? It's because this, every person, Christian or non-Christian, has something inside of us that's crying out for more. The Bible says deep cries out to deep. The Bible says that uh, man's heart is deep waters in one passage. You know, 
there's something inside of each one of us. Maybe you've heard it put this way. It kind of was popular a while back. There's a God-shaped hole in all of us that only he can fill. But when we don't fill it with God, we try to fill it with something else. When we don't obey God, we'll find ourselves going after other carnal pursuits. And why, how are we supposed to be obeying God in this passage? Imitating God. So as a believer, you get saved, and then you get challenged with a word like this, now walk and live like Jesus. If you don't do what he said here, imitate God and walk in love, you will start adding these other things into your life and heading towards a destructive path. Even after you're saved, you can start becoming a carnal Christian. That's why over and over again in the epistles, he says, get rid of this carnal mind. He's talking to Christians. Christians, put on a spiritual mind. Think things God's way. Speak things God's way. Do things God's way. Otherwise, if you don't, if you think it's unattainable, if you don't believe God and you will not obey him, you will turn into a fornicator or an unclean person, and you will begin to dabble in those behaviors. Why? Because there's something inside of us that's looking for more. There's something inside of us that's searching for the more. I remember uh, my good friends that I did real estate with, Bob and Leanne Green over in Texas County. She was telling me about when they got sa or married, not saved, and she had grown up in a, a Lutheran church, which was a good church. It was nothing wrong with it other than the fact that it wasn't a spirit-filled church in the sense of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so he was being real gentle. He had grown up Pentecostal, but he told her one time, hey, would you come? They went to her church because he just wanted, you know, he was just happy that she was a Christian and so on and so forth. But he said, uh, he brought her to a, a church service one time. He asked her and they went to a, I don't remember if it was an assembly or, but it was some sort of Pentecostal church. And she uh, heard about this phrase, the more. And she witnessed some, working in the Holy Spirit during that service. And she, she's the one that told me the story. She said, I got in the car afterwards. We walked out there. I seen people talking in different tongues. I seen all sorts of things happen I'd never seen before. And I just thought to myself, she goes, I was just thinking and thinking. She's like, she finally she goes, Bob, what's the more? What's the more? And he said, well, he goes, why do you ask? She goes, because I don't even know what it is, but I want it. I want more. I've always felt that there was something more than just trying to live a good Christian life. He goes, you're right, there's a whole bunch more. I don't know how Christians can read this Bible that talks so much about the Holy Spirit and just be happy with the being saved and going to heaven someday when it's filled with examples of the more. There's something deeper that God wants us to walk in. And today we're talking about being imitators of him. These sins are not fitting for saints. Here's what's fitting for saints, to walk like Jesus did. I'm here to tell you if you're walking like the world is walking, it's telling me something's not right on the inside. Because what we say and do comes from what we think and believe. You can say all that you want about what you believe, but if it doesn't match eventually what you do, Houston, we've got a problem. Houston, we've got a problem. Notice the foolish talk and coarse joking is the next portion there in the next scripture. It's one I'm telling that we got to be careful about because, hey, I like to make jokes. I like to cut it up and have a good time. But notice that it says instead, how does it word it here? Neither filthiness, da, 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 but rather giving thanks. And it contrasts the way that we talk to thanksgiving. Being unthankful is not recognizing the true value in a person or a thing. So because we're not seeing with spiritual eyes, oftentimes we make jokes about it or we talk coarsely about it. And um, what we don't realize is that our words are so powerful that even when we can just, a lot of times people, I was just joking. But you don't realize that jokes can also tear down. Jokes can also um, mock. Jokes can also uh, turn into gossip. Jokes can also break somebody down and hurt somebody. So again, when it comes to even joking and coarse talking, 
it's important to realize how powerful our words are and be careful with that. Eventually, if we're not mindful of the slippery slope, it can lead to spiritual death. My third point is the fate of sinners. Verse 5 says this in Ephesians there. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, or covetous man who's an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You can put some music on if we got it there, Stephanie. But are you a sinner or are you a saint? I want you to notice this transition that takes place. In verse 3 and 4, it says, fornication and uncleanness are not fitting or covetousness. Those are things. But notice now, as we get into this next set of verses, now all of a sudden, it's not just fornication, it's a fornicator. See how it switched from a sin that someone might struggle with to the identity of a person? Are you a sinner or are you a saint? In other words, what it's saying here is that, again, remember, this is written to Christians. It's possible to start to dabble with sin and the next thing you know, you've backslidden away from the grace of God. That's an area that has some contention within the church. But I'm telling you right now, this scripture is telling us that if you mess with fornication, you mess with uncleanness in your life, if you mess with it and it's not brought under the blood of Jesus Christ, don't let anybody deceive you with vain words and, and make you think that you're fine. Well, I was saved when I was four and five. I, I was fine. I got saved when I was 18 and, you know, you know, it's just the, the word that people use, the once saved, always saved word. But, uh, but it's just not true. It's just not true. Here's how you can know that you can stay away from that. Imitate God and don't get into this other stuff. But I want to read you this. Matter of fact, I'm kind of dealing with that doctrine here today. So let's just have a time of teaching, if you will. Can you be saved and then get into sin and walk away from God? I believe absolutely. I'm not going to use the scriptures that you might have normally heard, but let me, let me read you a little passage written to a church in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. And I'm going to read it in the Amplified Classic so you can see some of the, the additional words in there. And it says this, And to the angel, the messenger of the assembly church. Hey, that's us, the assembly church. In Sardis, though, we're in Norwood, so we'll have to put that in there. To the assembly church in Norwood, right? If the word fits, if the word fits. Just examine our hearts, look at this. These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God, the sevenfold Holy Spirit, and the seven stars, which I know your record and what you are doing, that you are supposed to be alive, but in reality, you are dead. He's writing to a church. He's writing to a church. So, for those that are reading and are catching this, he says this, Rouse yourself and keep awake. And strengthen and invigorate what remains and is on the point of dying. So there's some that are in reality are dead, but there's others that are on the point of dying. For I have not found a thing that you have done, any work of yours. Remember, we're talking about being imitators of God, walking in love, doing the works of God. I have not found any work of yours meeting the requirements of my God or perfect in his sight. So call to mind the lessons you've received and heard. Remember the word preached. Remember what we've been training and getting taught on. Call to mind these lessons and continually lay them to heart and obey them and repent. In case you will not rouse yourselves and keep awake and watch, I will come upon you like a thief, and you will not know or suspect at what hour I will come. Yet you still have a few persons, names in Sardis, who have not soiled their clothes. Let that be us. And they shall walk with me in white because they're worthy and deserving. Thus shall he who conquers, or the person who's victorious, will be clad in white garments. And this is the part about, 
about our eternal salvation. And I will not erase or blot out his name from the book of life. I just want to pause there for a moment. What do you blot out or erase? Something that's not written there or something that's written there? You blot out and you erase something that was written there. So is it possible to have your name written in the Lamb's book of life and then have it erased? According to Revelation chapter 3, that's a possibility. Don't dabble with these sins. But you know what? You got no strength to do it by just trying to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. There's only one way to do it. Be an imitator of God. Be like Jesus. The only way you can do it is be like Jesus. I'm not talking about going from here right now when you don't even know anything uh, hardly yet or really know if you're fully convinced on it and then trying to go walk on water or something like that. What I'm talking about is in, his, in your thinking, in your speaking, and then that will eventually work its way into your doing. Let me finish this verse, though, since it's up there. I will not erase or blot out his name from the book of life. I will acknowledge him. I want to be acknowledged by God as mine. And I will confess his name openly before my father and before his angels. He who is able to hear, let him listen to and heed what the Holy Spirit says to the assemblies of God, <laughs> to the churches. I just like that in the Amplified because it happens to mention the assemblies. That's pretty cool. That's us. That's us, folks. Don't flirt with sin. I don't know who coined this, but I have heard it said, sin will take you where you don't want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than you want to pay. Verse 6, back in Ephesians, says, Let no one deceive you with these empty words, for because of these things, sin, the wrath of God, comes upon the sons of disobedience. Kind of back to our Sunday school lesson this morning for those that were there. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Don't be partakers with them. Are we called to be the judge, jury, and executioner? No. But we are called to be a referee once in a while and hey when there's a foul we throw a flag and we say hey I got an eye and I got a spirit and I'm telling you this is right and this is wrong and as for me and my house we serve the Lord as much as I am a Pentecost I don't know if that's the right way to say it. I'm Pentecost. As much as I'm a Pentecostal believer and I believe in freedom, I believe in victory, I believe in saying what you want, not what you got, because our words are powerful. I believe in, in, in believing in the unseen before I see it as if I've already gotten it. I believe in those things. I'm a Pentecostal believer. I believe that life and death is in the power of the tongue. Even though I believe in all those things, Jesus said clearly, well, maybe it was Paul or whatever, but I could, you know what? I can put Jesus in there almost anywhere because he's the one that inspired the words that were written. And he said this, what then? Shall I go on sinning since grace is so great? Absolutely not. I believe it was Paul that wrote that, but like I said, through the Holy Spirit, he wrote that. Meaning what? Why would it matter if I was saved forever and there was nothing? Why would it matter? Because it'll lead you back on a path to destruction. So, but I'm not struggling with fornication, Pastor. Well, how about unforgiveness? How about bitterness? How about anger? How about unwilling to imitate Jesus Christ? How about, do you think it's a sin to think wrongly of what he said that we're to do? Or is it only a, you know, we have to remember there's two types of sins out there. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. The sins of commission, that's where you went and you fornicated. You went and did something wrong. Or the sins of omission. 
that's where you omitted something. You didn't do something you were supposed to do. You didn't heal the sick. You didn't even try. Yeah, I'm not saying you can always control the results on that, but you didn't even try. You were like, well, that's for a preacher. You didn't try to set the captive free, get those that were in bondage loosened. You didn't bring a cup of cold water to the least of these or visit me while I was in prison, the Bible says. You didn't do, you omitted, you omitted, you omitted. Well, don't dabble with sin. If you dabble with sin, if you think, well, you know, my best years are behind now, it's too late for me to get involved in any kind of ministry stuff, that's a dangerous way of thinking. It's a dangerous way of thinking. We're all called for all of our life to be imitators of Jesus. Here's the solution to all these things. Don't be partakers with them, the Bible says. So what can you do? You can be like Jesus. Think the word, speak the word, and do the word. God always gives us a better alternative than the ways of the world. If he says, don't do that, he also says, instead, do this. Here's a great example. Again, I don't have the reference, but the Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauch or, uh, not debauchery. Um, huh? Drunkenness, yeah, yeah. So don't be with drunken wine, which uh, leads to dissipation is the word that the Bible uses. I didn't put that in there, but here's what it does say. But be filled with the Spirit. He didn't just say, don't do this. He said, instead, do that. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. If God says don't do something, he gives us something better to do. So don't be partakers with the world and with the flesh. Instead, be an imitator of God. Be like Jesus. Let me tell you, there's no comparison. The Holy Spirit in my book, he wins every single time. Sin is a counterfeit. It seems good for a while, and it may even provide some temporary satisfaction. But in the end, the Bible says it leads to death. And then there's the truth of God's word, which will never disappoint. It'll never fade away, and it always leads to eternal life. So Norwood Assembly, let me tell you this morning, we need to be like Jesus. We need to be like Jesus. When someone says, what are you trying to do with your life? Let it be our answer. I'm trying to be like Jesus. If nothing else, it'll spark up some great conversations with people. And then you can share with them these scriptures here where the Bible says to be imitators of, of God. So I like to remind myself in closing of some of these promises of God. I like to think on them meditate on them, chew on them, roll them around in my mind so that they'll come out of my mouth, I'll believe them, and then I'll do them. And here's what I like to roll around in my mind is that God will never leave me or forsake me, that he's made his dwelling place within me, which means when I walk into the room, God walks into the room with me. When I walk into the room, you can expect the anointing to be involved because the anointed one is in me. He lives inside of me. That when I say words, if I'm being listening, if I'm listening to God, if I'm speaking because I hear him saying, then I can expect those words to not fall flat on the ground. They ought to achieve whatever God wanted them to achieve. I need to think on these things, to roll these things around in my mind, to chew on them, to remember I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm all these things. Just think on all these promises of God. Think on them. Chew on them. When people ask you how you're doing today, they say, well, say, I'm blessed by the best. I haven't said it in a little while, but this used to be my phrase. I'd say to everybody, I've said it here before, but memorize this one. I am too blessed to be stressed. I am too anointed to be disappointed, and I'm too equipped to get whipped. Memorize that one. When someone, how are you doing today? Well, I'm just barely muddling through. Get out of here. I am too blessed to be stressed. 
I'm too anointed to be disappointed. And I'm too equipped to be whipped. I refuse unforgiveness to have any place in my life. I refuse bitterness, anger, hurt, depression, heavy heart to have any part in my life. I choose to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's what I choose to have in my life, the fruit of the Spirit. And if you'll do that, if you'll think upon these things, if you'll speak these things, if you will do these things, I'm telling you, you will have a victorious life. You'll have a victorious life. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. How many in here listen to any Christian television or any hear any prophetic words online or is there any podcasts and other things? Anybody in here? I wanted to tell you, I have a little variety. I hear little tidbits, but probably more than a dozen or more different ministers that have been, that are very uh, good brothers that are dependable. And I'm telling you, there's a word that's going around in the spiritual realm. There's a word that's going around in churches all over the place, and that's this. Before the Lord's coming, which is very soon, very soon, God's going to have another great revival. There's going to be a billion or more souls that are going to be saved. There's going to be miracles, signs, and wonders that are going to be working like it's the, day, the, the book of Acts chapter 2 all over again. And it's going to be a bigger awakening than the first and the second great awakening. This third great awakening we're going to have is something the world's never seen before. Nor would we got to get ready to be a part of that. And that's what I'm uh, aiming my heart towards is this great move that God is doing. It's got to start in here, but it needs to get out of here and work its way out. Let me pray for you here, but I want to encourage you. We are, some of these songs are, we have a lot of good songs and they, they'll talk about, oh man, I can't wait to get out of here and get to heaven. Anytime I see those, I'm like, I have to do a check in my own spirit. In church, I got to go, Lord, I disagree with that song for a moment here because, I, yeah, I am excited about heaven and I'll be ready to go right now. If the Lord wants to take me right now, there's nothing holding me back. I'm ready to go. I want to be with Jesus. But here's the truth. I am with Jesus. He's right here with me and he's got a work to do on this earth and there's only one way for him to do it. It's with his hands and his feet. That's you and that's me. We've got to be the catalyst that's going to usher in, if you will, this third great awakening. And so I'm thinking, I, I don't want to be so heavenly minded that I'm of no earthly good, if I could say it that way. God has a work for us to do right here. Let's be mindful about that. Let's be thinking about that. Don't worry. When it's your time, you'll go straight to the side of Christ. You'll be right with him. No problem. But right now, there's a hurting world that needs us. And we need to resemble this victorious bride that the Lord's coming for. So there's still a work to be done right here in me as well. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Let's pray.